Hi, this is documentary filmmaker John Ziegler. I'm the guy who runs the website www.framingpaterno.com. And in the aftermath of the interview that Dottie Sandusky and I did on the Today Show, I decided it was a pretty good time to address my critics. And I have plenty of those from all sides of this particular story. As a matter of fact, as I was making a list to prepare for this video, I realized, wow, um, I have a lot of critics. This video could be fairly long, so please bear with me, but there's a lot of important and I think interesting things I need to say about those who are criticizing me in this story in its totality, as well as specifically on the Dottie Sandusky interview, none of which, of course, is surprising uh, that I would get that kind of uh, criticism. I anticipated it, but I also wanted to make sure that uh, I addressed these critics specifically. So let's start with my critics in the news media, and as I make this video, the second interview that Dottie Sandusky and I did with CNN is currently being held hostage, and that's a pretty correct term to use, being held hostage by CNN. Uh, here's what happened. We did a second interview with CNN the morning that the Today Show interview aired, and the reason why we did this was that the reporter, Jason Carroll, who has been schmoozing Dottie and Jerry Sandusky for quite some time, even visited them in prison, was extremely agitated when he heard about the Today Show interview. And he called me and basically begged me. He said, please, you've got to let me do an, uh, the primetime exclusive interview, because that's the way this normally works. They need to be able to claim they have some sort of exclusive to make it somewhat newsworthy. And he kept begging me, begging me, come on, you got to let me do this, I'll be fair, I'm sympathetic, blah, blah, blah. Of course, I'm not believing any of this. I said, well, make me a proposal and I'll see whether or not it makes any sense. Well, long story short, he comes up with an interesting idea, which I thought would create a safety valve for us, because I'm always expecting to get screwed by these jackals in the media at any moment. And because that's what happened, that's what's been happening for the last two plus years, and these people are just not to be trusted. So he says to me, um, what if we can assure you that you will be on the set with Anderson Cooper live after we air the edited version of the interview? I said, well, that makes sense because then they can't put this panel of jackals or a victim's attorney up there to mock Dottie or to tell lies about what happened and then they get the last word. So that was something that I thought was important because it provided us some protection. I said, well, put it in writing and we'll see whether we can do it. So he puts it in writing. Logistically, we were able to make it work. Dottie wanted to do it because she trusted this guy. Jerry wanted to do it because he trusted this guy, Jason Carroll. So we go and we do the interview. And the interview was actually really good. Dottie was spectacular. As good as she was in the Today Show interview, she was even better in the CNN interview. I think because she was relaxed and it was just a little bit different atmosphere. Matt Lauer is a big celebrity. Jason Carroll isn't. Uh, and so it's just natural to be able to do something better the second time you, you try it. So I felt decent about the interview, although there were a few things that Jason Carroll tried to pull to try to make me look bad, uh, which made me think, okay, what's this guy really all about? And then he did a couple of things after the interview, which were incredibly shady, and I'm going to hold off on commenting on until I see what, if anything, CNN ever actually airs. Of course, they may never air any of this, because the deal was that it would air that night. Well, Im immediately after the, uh, we do the interview, things start to get weird. And long story short, they send me to New York on two puddle jumpers through Philadelphia. I landed in New York to be on the Anderson Cooper show that night. This would have been Wednesday, March the 12th, the, the night uh, that the Today Show interview aired in the morning with Dottie and me. And I get told that I have been bumped for breaking news. And I'm thinking, well, what's the breaking news? The, the plane has gone missing now for four or five days. That's not breaking news. They didn't find the plane. There was a building collapse in New York. But that didn't seem like that big of a deal. And when I watched the Anderson Cooper show that night, there was hardly anything on the building collapse. So then I suddenly realized, because they weren't telling me when they were going to reschedule this, and they were clearly making it obvious they were not going to adhere to their deal to have me on set, which could have been political, it could have been logistical, it could have been a combination of both, I'm not sure. I don't know if this was a pure bait and switch, a lie, I don't know why, but it was very obvious to me they were not going to adhere to that part of the deal. But what did become very, very obvious to me was that this was not an issue of breaking news. 
on CNN's part. This was an issue of uh, we found out we had a hit on our hands with the missing plane. You see, the, the ratings come in on any particular night at 11 a.m. the next morning. That's when they first get the first sense of how any particular story did. And what I think happened was on that Wednesday morning at 11 a.m., the suits at CNN go, all right, we've got two days in a row, Monday and Tuesday, where this plane story is a huge hit. We're going 24-7 on the plane. And we're now a week later, and they're still going 24-7 on the plane because they're chasing after the ratings. Now, this... It's a whole different story, which I think is incredibly important uh, because it shows just how bastardized cable news has become and how the cart is driving the horse and how now every quote-unquote news organization is chasing after whatever story happens to hit, whether it's in internet uh, traffic or uh, overnight ratings or whatever it is. That's not the way news is supposed to be determined. So we're now in a world where <laughs> breaking news is, oh my gosh, we have a hit. And so since then... CNN has been dodging when they're going to air the Dottie Sandus Sandusky interview. They originally put on their website that it was going to air this past Tuesday, March 18th, but that came and passed. They sent Dottie an email saying no one could have possibly anticipated all of the viewer interest in the Lost Plane story, basically copping to the reality that this was all about ratings. And so I don't know what they're going to do with this. I'm sure they're going to screw us eventually whether it's by not airing this and not putting the entire interview online as they promised in writing uh, or by airing it, you know, and then putting on somebody afterwards to rip or mock Dottie. I'm not sure which, but they're clearly not going to adhere to their written, written word because written word means nothing to these media jackals anymore, especially not when you're in a situation like we're in on this story where they know nobody in the media is going to come to our defense. Nobody in the media is going to say, well, this was wrong for CNN not to adhere to their written deal because we are lepers. Literally, we're lepers. In fact, we're worse than lepers. Lepers would at least have some sympathy. We don't even get sympathy for being lepers uh, because people think we're crazy when in fact we're the ones telling the truth here and with no incentive to lie because we're not making any money. Uh, in fact, Dottie Sandusky, it's important to point out, gave up an enormous amount of money to tell her story in a very different way, in a different outlet, uh, but she didn't want to do that. Even though she's broke, They've taken away Jerry's pension. She has virtually no income. She decided to do this the right way, and she deserves an awful lot of credit for that. So that's CNN, and I'll hold off on further comment until I understand the full proportions of just how much they're going to screw us here. Then there was the, the written response uh, to the interview with Dottie Sandusky and me, and I guess the most prominent and maybe the most outrageous came from Dan Wetzel of Yahoo Sports. And this guy has been incredibly anti-Penn State, anti-Paterno from day one. And he wrote just a vicious, horrible hit piece on Dottie and me, although he doesn't actually mention me by name, uh, as if that mattered. I mean, it was clear who he was talking about. Uh, but the ignorance, I mean, the utter, flat-out, total ignorance, disregard for even a semblance of the truth is just seeping through every pore of the piece that Dan Wetzel put out there. Uh, some of the things are, are so inaccurate, they're not even bother, it's not even bother getting into. It doesn't make any damn sense. And of course, he didn't even bother to contact me for the story. I mean, I'm the most accessible person on the planet, whether it's email, Twitter, my phone number, whatever. It's easy to get a hold of me. And Wetzel didn't even try because he didn't want to. Because see, if they talk to me, then they might actually have to deal with some facts. It's not as easy for them to lie if they actually speak to the person who knows what the heck's going on. And so I tried to, I, I must have sent Wetzel 20 tweets and an email, never got any response. I even offered him $3,000 to his charity of choice if he just debated me on a radio show or did an extensive interview and published the whole thing with me on the topic of his column, got no response. This is a guy who's claiming to be all about the victims. Oh, the victims. This is horrible that Dottie is telling her story because it's so terrible for the victims, all of whom, by the way, got paid about $2 million or maybe more when it's all said and done. Uh, but, it, but it's horrible for the victims. Wetzel's claiming to be for the victims, uh, but he won't accept money for charity, whatever charity he wants, uh, simply to hear my side of the story or to even debate me. And by the way, if I'm so wrong and we're, and it's so obvious that I'm wrong and he has, has so much venom for me 
or, or our side of the story, then why not take me on and destroy me? Wouldn't that be fun? Wouldn't that make you look good? Why is it that he and no one else of his ilk ever wants to do that, even when it's for charity money? It's obvious, because they're afraid. They, they know deep down they would get destroyed. The fact's not on their side. But of course, the general public doesn't know any of this. So the general public cheers. And Michelle Beadle from uh, ESPN cheers. And then she sicks uh, hundreds of her uh, Twitter followers on me. Uh, when I actually offered Michelle Beadle to talk to Dottie Sandusky, because she had tweeted something nasty about Dottie, and she didn't even want to talk to Dottie. Now, <laughs> I mean... These people have no shame whatsoever. They rip people. I say, here, you want to talk to her? Uh, and no, no interest in talking because that might uh, actually cloud my mind with some actual facts uh, and some actual reality, and that might make me uncomfortable, and I won't be able to live in my little pretend fantasy world uh, where good is good and I'm good and everyone else is wrong and people will cheer me who know, have no idea what the facts of the case are. Then there was a New York Magazine article, again, I'm incredibly accessible. This one was about me uh, and my relationship with NBC, which was really pretty freaking hilarious. Um, I'm in the headline, and the basic article in the New York Magazine um, was basically that NBC and I are in cahoots. I'm paraphrasing here, but that I take it easy on, him, on NBC because I want access to Matt Lauer to tell my stories. You know, I gave them the Sarah Palin interview after the 2008 election, and uh, I gave them the Jerry Sandusky interview last year, and now here I'm giving them the Dottie Sandusky interview, and uh, somehow I don't criticize NBC. Now, not only did this person not bother to contact me <laughs> to find out the actual story, because again, the facts might get in the way of a nice little narrative that you're creating, uh, the reality is that I made an entire documentary film, which made a lot of money, called Media Malpractice, in which I would say NBC and NBC were not only involved, they were the stars. Without a doubt, the stars of the movie. I have ripped NBC backwards and forwards for their coverage of Barack Obama Sarah, and Sarah Palin. Now, as far as this particular story, if you go to my website, framingpaterna.com, and you watch the mini-movie, you know that NBC is a huge part, huge part, <laughs> Of, of the narrative that was created, and I criticized them for that. The reason why I've gone to NBC is because I respect Matt Lauer as an interviewer. He's interested in the story. He's at least somewhat open-minded. I've dealt with them in the past. The devil you know is better than the devil you don't know. Uh, and so it's really not rocket science. It's not a conspiracy. And I can assure you that in no way, shape, or form have I taken it easy on NBC. I will also suggest, you know, Matt, Matt Lauer is not only open-minded, but Bob Costas has shown himself to be even more than open-minded and has even changed his mind about some of this story, at least regarding the cover-up and Joe Paterno's lack of involvement in it. And so, since the rest of the media is completely, totally, 100% in the tank, at least NBC has shown some semblance of, of ethics and open-mindedness to find out, okay, well, is it possible we got some of this wrong? So that's why I've gone to NBC on this particular story. And because Matt Lauer was willing to come to State College and tape an interview with Dottie, because that's the only way this could get done. So there's no conspiracy here, and it's all pretty simple if someone just calls me. Then there's Allison Steele of the Philadelphia Inquirer, and wow. In just the last week, she, she did a hit piece on me and Dottie, which was full of inaccuracies. As a matter of fact, it ends with a quote from Aaron Fisher's attorney saying uh, that there's no way to disbelieve 10 victims, none of whom know, knew each other. This was the dramatic quote that Allison Steele uses to finish her hit piece on Dottie and me. Of course, it's inaccurate. There were not 10 victims at trial. There were eight victims at trial, and four of them are pictured together in Jerry Sandusky's book. I said to Allison, who, by the way, did actually call me in an airport. Uh, we had a couple of brief conversations before the cell coverage crapped out. Um, so she, she at least contacted me. But, of course, the article in no way, shape, or form depicted what I said to her. The article starts off with a conspiracy theory. That that's what that the entire premise of the article is this is a conspiracy theory. And I couldn't have made it more clear to her that I'm the anti-conspiracy person. I don't believe in any kind of conspiracies in general, and specifically in this case. So I don't know what the heck she was listening to. 
I then say to her afterwards, I said, are you going to correct what Aaron Fisher's attorney said, which was blatantly inaccurate? No, no response uh, whatsoever. And, and then she writes uh, in today's newspaper uh, that uh, this article about some some uh, correspondence or some documentation that Frank Fina, the Sandusky prosecutor, had told the judge way, way before this story broke that it's possible that a lot of people at Penn State knew uh, about Jerry Sandusky. By the way, I never understand what the word knew or know about Sandusky means. What does that mean? You knew about Sandusky. Now, you, you knew Sandusky had boundary issues. You knew he was uh, want to shower with kids. Or you knew he was a child molester. Because those are two totally different things. And the reality is there's absolutely no evidence that anybody knew that the latter was going on, probably because it wasn't. And knowing about the former is not that big of a deal and is perfectly consistent with everything that Penn State said and did in this case. And so she reports, Steele does, that somehow FINA knew very early on that this was a big conspiracy to cover up at Penn State, yet she never even mentions that FINA well after this correspondence with the judge, after the trial, does an interview with 60 Minutes where he specifically says he does not believe Joe Paterno was involved in a cover-up. And she doesn't even mention that in the story. Probably because she's not aware of it. Because that didn't make big news. And these media people are morons, they're incompetent, they're ignorant, and it, they think that if it wasn't in the New York Times, it didn't happen. Well, it did happen. And I've tried to correspond with her saying, are you aware of this? And of course, got no response. And I think one of the most amazing things about that article, which of course is way beyond the grasp of an Allison Steele, is that Fina tells the judge, and I, this is a paraphrase, but it's pretty close, tells the judge that because Paterno and McQuarrie reacted so strongly that first weekend to the story of uh, McQuarrie seeing Sandusky in the shower with a boy, that this m is proof that there had to be a sex act involved and that therefore Penn State is covering up or lying or perjuring themselves or, you know, Spaniard, Curly, and Schultz are perjuring themselves because there's no explanation for why Paterno would actually react so strongly. So wait a minute, hold on. So the theory that Nafita has is that if Paterno is simply doing his due diligence and making damn sure that this thing is taken care of and that there is no problem here. So in a sense, in Fina's words, if Paterno is overreacting to the report he gets, that can actually be used later as evidence of underreacting if the story changes by investigator manipulation 10 years later. That's how crazy this is. <laughs> I think it's actually the most simple ex simplest explanation. Paterno was doing his due diligence, wanted to make sure this was taken care of properly, which is completely consistent with everything we know about him. <laughs> and now somehow, 10 years later, this is proof that somehow Penn State was covering up because there's no way that Paterno would have done this for just an allegation of horsing around in the shower. Well, wait a minute, I thought taking a shower with a boy was this horrific, horrible thing. Which is it, Frank Fina? I, to me, it's just so obvious what's really happened here, but that's beyond the grasp of the media, especially my critics in the media. So that, I want to take care of, the, obviously there's a lot more to talk about with regard to the media critics I have. I guess the main thing I would suggest is that for two plus years, I have dealt with dozens and dozens of media people of all ilks, all shapes and sizes, from the top to the bottom of the media food chain. And other than Bob Costas, um, Matt Lauer, Kevin Slayton, Jeff Byers, um, Mangino in Pittsburgh, other than that, those few people, and I may, might be forgetting a couple of others, uh, other than those, I have found that nobody has the knowledge, no, and certainly nobody has the courage, to figure out what really happened here. And that they are, they are all in lockstep with the media mob mentality. That, you know, the, the herd mentality of, well, we all got to stick together because if anybody goes outside of the herd in this story, they're going to get killed. And it's just disgusting. And frankly, it's one of the reasons why I'm so confident that I'm right, because it's not possible for all these morons, none of whom know any of the facts, to be right about this.
Not one! I just found one who has a clue. It's really quite amazing. Then I want to address the, um, the accuser's attorneys, because now they're starting to go after me. In fact, uh, the CNN reporter, Jason Carroll, was using quotes from them about me in the interview, if you ever see it, if CNN ever releases it, which I think exposed an awful lot. And I'll just say this about them. I find it amazing that um, victims' attorneys or accusers' attorneys who are getting paid millions of dollars, and in the case of Andrew Shubin, who's the key victim attorney, accuser attorney in all this, he represented the victim to the McQuarrie uh, victim, accuser, not even really accuser, but whatever you want to call him, and Matt Sandusky, uh, as well as apparently seven others that got uh, settlements in this case, uh, the reality is those are the people who are the villains here. They're the ones who made the most money, not the accusers, it's the attorneys. And for them to be given any credibility is astonishing to me. I haven't made a dime from this, purposely haven't tried to make a dime, put out a film for free, a book for free, didn't take any money whatsoever in any way, shape or form for setting up the Dottie Sandusky interview, yet I'm the one who has credibility problems. <laughs> and they're the ones who are somehow telling the truth even though they got paid more money than anybody else did. And obviously have a huge incentive to continue this fraud, this myth, uh, that they've been able to perpetuate because they knew as soon as Joe Paterno was fired that, oh my gosh, Penn State was going to happen to have to open up Fort Knox and this was going to be the easiest payday of all time. Now I want to um, address the general public. I get that the general public is 99, 98% against me, especially outside of State College in Pennsylvania where they actually have a clue about the facts of this case. Uh, I guess the th two things that confuse me most about the general public is, number one, I'm bearing good news. I've never understood why it is that so many people want there to have been abused kids. But that seems to be the, the premise here. I, I, you would think that me telling them, guess what? I don't think that anybody was truly sexually abused. I don't believe that there was any rapes. I don't believe there was any oral sex. I don't believe that Jerry Sandusky ever had an actual sex act with a, with a boy. I don't think there's any evidence of it. You would think this would be embraced as great news. No, because people have bought into a story. I guess now they would feel very uncomfortable if, if they put a guy in prison for life and destroyed Penn State over nothing. So I guess they have a disincentive to now believe this. But you would think more people would be like, oh my gosh, thank goodness this didn't actually happen. But human beings are weird and stupid and weak, and I guess that's why they react the way that they do. So then, of course, they need to figure out, well, what's this guy's angle, right? because they can't figure me out, they can't take me up on the facts, take me on on the facts, so I must have an angle. What's my angle? Well, of course, everyone always presumes money, which they should. Well, as I've already stated, not making a dime, purposely not making a dime. We don't even put ads on our website or any of the videos that I've put out. Nothing. We're as clean, as pure as the driven snow on this. Uh, I've never asked for money for anything other than a very specific project. I've never taken any more money than I needed on a specific project. As a matter of fact, I've turned away money. I had $50,000 in pledges to start a, another film on this, which I refused to take because I did not believe that the film was viable for a number of reasons having to do with the nature of this story. So <laughs> I don't know what else I could do on the money aspect of this. I'm destroying my career. So I have no incentive there either. I've made that very clear. Matt Lauer stated that on the Today Show, for heaven's sakes, that, you know, Ziegler knows he's destroying his career over this. Um, and now Lauer knows I'm doing that. Uh, I think he respects that, but I think he also thinks, well, why, why in the world are you doing this? Well, the reason I'm doing this is because I know I'm right. There's no one else. There is no one else in a position to say or do anything about this. If there was, believe me, I'd be thrilled. Please take this off my hands. I mean, it's driving me crazy. It's driving my wife crazy. You know, I, I, there, there's absolutely nothing in this for me. <laughs> and the notion that there is, is, is mind blowing because it's so obvious. This was not the conclusion I wanted to come to. I fought this conclusion for over a year after interviewing Jerry Sandusky in prison for the first time. By the way, that's part of why I'm confident I'm right, because I fought this tooth and nail. But finally, everything around me, all the facts, all of the narratives 
all of the common sense and logic led me to the conclusion that Jerry Sandusky never had sex with a boy, that at least there's no evidence of it, and it makes no sense in the larger narrative. So that's the general public. Unfortunately, our attention spans are now way, way, way too short for anybody to deal with this case, because everything takes a couple of minutes to explain the context of. This story requires way too much knowledge, way too much context, way too much analytical ability. It's just beyond the comprehension of the average uh, person who's moved on long ago from this story and way beyond the comprehension of the average media moron who has a financial and career incentive to continue the current BS narrative. Then I want to deal with Penn Staters because obviously Penn Staters are in a completely different group uh, here than the rest of the public. They have a much um, greater understanding of what did and did not happen. They obviously have a much larger incentive to get to the bottom of this. And they have splintered into many different groups. In general, I have said that Penn Staters are in three groups. A third still buy into the BS narrative and are just so clueless that, you know, they're hopeless. There's nothing you can do about them. A third, I think, deep down realize that the narrative is mostly if not totally BS, but they're afraid to admit it. One, because they, their friends will think that uh, you know, they're child molester protectors, pedophile protectors, or uh, they will themselves will have to admit that they threw Joe Paterno and their own university under the bus without any evidence, and that's difficult to do. So they're pretty much lost, although they're silently maybe a little bit for us or at least somewhat open-minded. Then there's a third who know that the narrative is BS and they're fighting mad about it and aren't going to move on uh, and want to do something about it. So I really respect those people. It's actually the middle group that I have the biggest problem with. The people who ought to know better and don't have the guts to do anything about it, I have disdain for that group. And, and that's part of why uh, I've actually you know, expressed disdain for people who, who people say, well, they're on your side, John. Well, no. Actually, I hold the people on my side or our side, whatever side this is, uh, to a higher standard. Because if you know better and do nothing, then I have no respect for that. Take Todd Blackledge as an example. Todd Blackledge is a great guy, smart guy, religious guy. Obviously, quarterback Joe Paterno's first national championship game spoke at his, uh, our championship team, uh, spoke at his memorial service. I've had numerous conversations with Todd. Todd has acknowledged that I'm the reason why he realized the narrative was BS after watching my documentary film, The Framing of Joe Paterno. I've had lunch with Scott, uh, Todd, not Scott, we will get to Scott Paterno in a second. I've had lunch with Todd, uh, interviewed Todd, did his most extensive interview on this, but I knew very early on, and I put this in my book, The Betrayal of Joe Paterno, that Todd was never going to do anything publicly that risks himself, because he works for ESPN. And he's had numerous opportunities to do something about this and has done nothing. And frankly, I hold him to a higher standard, because he's smart, he's religious, he believes in things, he knows the narrative is BS, but he will never do anything that puts himself at risk. And that I find unacceptable. I find that worse than if he was a moron and didn't realize what really did and didn't happen here, uh, or was ignorant, or just stupid enough to actually believe in the narrative. He doesn't, but he won't do anything about it. And that's why this story was allowed to uh, evolve the way that it was. If people like Todd Blackledge had stood up and said, wait a minute, this is wrong, and maybe even put their jobs on the line, this could have been stopped. And so that's why I've been hard on people like Todd Blackledge. Now, I mentioned uh, Scott Paterno inadvertently, and obviously Scott Paterno is a huge, huge part of this whole deal. Because the number one thing that my critics, especially Penn Staters, point to is even the Paterno family won't support John Ziegler, so why should we? And obviously, for someone who doesn't understand the story, that makes perfect sense. Absolutely. The reality is that Scott Paterno has made it very, 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 very clear through his public and private actions and words that he's not interested in what his dad wanted just before he died. A lot of what has driven me is that Joe Paterno said before he died, I want to find out, just find out what the truth is. Let's find out what the truth of what really happened here is. Now, I was not a huge Joe Paterno fan, but the guy deserved that. If he was going to have his life and legacy destroyed after 61 years of exemplary work, he deserved that dying wish. And I presumed, wrongly, that his family was going to honor that. 
Well, Scott has made it exceedingly clear to me he doesn't care about the truth in this case. Scott is a politician. He's not a good one. He got destroyed back before the paternal name was besmirched uh, in a Republican primary for Congress. He thinks he's a great politician. He's a great, a great strategist. He's not. Uh, Scott is a moron. That's just the reality of it. Uh, and I know he's a moron because he has said things to me about me that I know to be not only false, but utterly ridiculous. And because he has done that, I know, one, he's not very bright. Two, he's capable of lying easily if he thinks that it fits his particular agenda. But more importantly, having nothing to do with me in particular, it's very obvious that his entire take on this story is seen through the prism of not what was true, but what could affect a particular political outcome. And by the way, I'm fine with that. I am perfectly fine with that because I'm a realist. I understand that very few people are going to accept the real truth of what happened here, especially when so much of it is unprovable. I get you want to actually have a practical outcome. That's what the NCAA lawsuit is about. I applaud him for that. I get that. I'm a realist, okay? But first of all, admit what you're doing. Admit that this is a political movement, not a movement for the truth. And part of why I know this is not a movement for the truth is that when I interviewed Jerry Sandusky the first time in prison, and Scott Paterno uh, found out about this, I'm sure it's Anthony Lebrano, uh, he called me and went bananas. Not just a little bit bananas, 110% bananas. Profanity lay screaming for 15 to 20 minutes. I have a very detailed record of this phone call. There is a partial transcript of this phone call in my online book, The Betrayal of Joe Paterno, uh, in Chapter 9, which you want to take a look at. And to me, it tells you everything you need to know about Scott Paterno on a number of levels. Not just his temper. Look, I got a temper too. I get that. Although, for, at this level of temper, for that length of time, this was not about me causing a political problem for the Paterno family. This was about Scott Paterno feeling threatened personally. And why would Scott Paterno feel threatened personally? Well, some might argue, well, you know, here's a situation where Ziegler is trying to be the hero and he wants to be the hero. I get, I get that, that's part, but that wouldn't explain this phone call, folks, even if Scott believed that, um, which I don't know that he does, but that wouldn't explain this phone call. Because not only was he at an 11 on a 10 scale for 15 to 20 minutes of outrage before hanging up on me, uh, which has to mean it was about him and not about the cause. But he says to me twice, twice in this phone call, that um, I will never, I'm paraphrasing, it's almost an exact quote, I will never let anything negative about Mike McQueary come out in the name of this family because he was afraid I was going to use Jerry Sandusky and victim number two to attack the credibility of Mike McQueary. Now, forget for a second the fact that destroying Mike McQueary's credibility can go a long way in helping the cause of Joe Paterno, that's not someone who is interested in the truth because he's already said it's a rule that no matter what comes out about Mike McQueary, we are not going to do anything that casts dispersions on Mike McQueary. Well, right there, game, set, match, you're not about the truth. Forget about the fact that there's a hell of a lot of reasons to besmirch the credibility of Mike McQueary and the fact that Jay Paterno knew about all of these things about Mike McQuarrie almost immediately. I had spoke with Jay Paterno in early September of 2012 in his den for several hours, and Jay Paterno told me everything that was going to eventually was in the ESPN, the magazine, Don Venata story about Mike McQuarrie, including stuff that ended up getting edited out or censored from that Don Venata story, which I've already documented and have further proof of uh, if necessary. Jay knew all of that. And I said, well, Jay, why didn't you guys rain hellfire down on Mike McQuarrie? And Jay said, well, you know, Dad said, take it easy on McQuarrie because he suffered enough already. Well, that's understandable because what Joe thought was the case before he died was very different than what happened after he died. He didn't know the sanctions were going to happen, that there was going to be all this cover-up talk from Louis Free, his statue would be taken down, the winds taken away. He had no knowledge of that. So I guess it was understandable at the time that Joe would say, take it easy on McQuarrie, because, by the way, I'm convinced that Joe didn't understand 
what Macquarie was really all about and why Macquarie would have had all these reasons to be vulnerable to manipulation. And I believe McQuarrie was manipulated. I don't believe McQuarrie flat out lied. I think that at each stage of this story, McQuarrie manipulated or was manipulated his version of the story based upon what he thought his self-interest was at that moment. And it's clear, and I've detailed it all uh, in chapter two of my book, The Betrayal of Joe Paterno. So why would Scott do this? Well, first of all, as I said, it's not, it shows it's not about the truth for Scott. But I think that there's an explanation that is incredibly important here. And I can't prove this, although I'm not the only one that suspects it. Some people very, very close to this case, including, by the way, Don Vanatta, told me that he had the very same suspicion. And we had not spoken about this until uh, we both expressed the fact that we thought that this was a theory that could explain a lot. I think that it is now very plausible that Scott Paterno, either directly or indirectly, was the reason why Joe Paterno used the term sexual nature and fondling in his grand jury testimony and later in his interview with the Office of the Attorney General two weeks before he got fired, which I think was an incredibly key moment because I believe that, that interview, which I broke exclusively, it's in my book, uh, chapter two, The Betrayal of Joe Paterno at FramingPaterno.com, that interview is incredibly important because I believe the Office of the Attorney General decided at that moment, I think when they got home, from the Paterno house, with that Joe Paterno backing up his grand jury testimony in their hand, they decided, okay, it's go time. I think they realized at that moment, all right, we're going to indict Sandusky, and we're going to indict Curley and Schultz because we need to protect McQuarrie's credibility. Because we can't just have Joe Paterno backing him up. We need to create a force field around Mike McQuarrie, and we're going to indict Curley and Schultz to make sure that happened. Without Joe Paterno, backing up to the hilt his very nebulous and vague and uncertain grand jury testimony of uh, 10 months or nine months earlier that year of 2011. I don't know that they indict even Sandusky. And interestingly enough, the only person that was at both Joe Paterno's grand jury testimony and at his interview with the Office of the Attorney General was Scott Paterno. So he was there. And I believe Scott had a motive to make sure that Joe Paterno's testimony matched that of Mike McQuarrie. Scott is an establishment guy. I've gotten to know him very, very well. When you're doing battle with somebody, I think you learn a lot more about him than if you're friends. Scott believes in the establishment. Wrongly, he believes in a lot of establishment people, especially in the conservative movement. He and I have had conversations about that. He's not a very good judge of character. And so I believe he bought in. I think he bought into the whole Sandusky story, and he thought the only way that Joe is remotely vulnerable here is, or my client, as he refers to his dad, the only way my client is remotely vulnerable here is if he somehow is charged with perjury, obstruction of justice. The only way that happens is if his testimony doesn't match up with McQuarrie's. So he made sure that happened. Now, can I prove that? Absolutely not. Scott has apparently denied that on Twitter, uh, but I don't believe anything Scott says at this point. Scott has a huge, huge incentive for, if, that's, if this is true, if this theory is true, Scott now has a huge incentive for McQuarrie to be right. Because if McQuarrie is wrong, he's not just a moron for the way he defended Joe Paterno those first few days before the firing, which was based upon the story being true, which it, I don't believe it was, but he's also vulnerable because he's the reason why Joe's testimony screwed the whole thing up. If we're right, if I'm right, and it's not just me, like I said, it's other people who believe the same thing coming to it independently. So now it, it makes it understandable why it is that Scott goes bananas to me on the phone. Because this isn't, isn't just about creating a small political problem for the Paterno family. No, 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 no. I'm getting too close now. Now I'm getting to a situation where I'm going to be able to prove that McQuarrie was wrong, and that means at the very least, Scott's a political idiot, if not the cause of why his father slash client backed up McQuarrie's testimony. Again, I cannot prove this, but it makes a hell of a lot of sense in the larger scheme of things. And let me tell you one other thing that, that made me feel this was accurate. Very early on, before Scott and I had any problems, one of my first conversations with Scott was with, uh, with, was with him about this issue of Joe Paterno's memory of the McQuarrie conversation being, quote-unquote, misrefreshed, as I like to phrase it. 
Of the dozens and dozens of people close to this case that I have spoken to about the misrefresh recollection theory, every single one of them has said two things. Wow, that makes a lot of sense because the words don't sound like Joe Paterno. And two, wow, wouldn't that be great because that would get Joe Paterno off the hook. The only exception to this, and this is not an exaggeration, not hyperbole, but the only exception to this was when I mentioned this to Scott Paterno. Scott Paterno ran away from this theory as fast as his fat little body could take him. I mean, that, that's, which I found to be incredibly odd. I'm like, Scott, if, if this happened, the, the whole story changes and he had no interest in discussing it, he shut it down immediately. Well, why would he do that? Again, completely consistent with this theory that either directly or indirectly, he's responsible for why Joe Paterno's testimony backed up Mike McQuarrie's, even though Mike McQuarrie's testimony is not accurate. So, unfortunately, it's incredibly complex and d difficult to prove. But when people say the Paterno family is against you, <laughs> so you must not be credible, um, folks, that means Scott Paterno. And if Scott Paterno is the gauge of my credibility, I sleep very well at night because Scott Paterno is a moron. Uh, he is not to be trusted. Uh, he has not been right on anything so far. I wish him the best in the NCAA lawsuit, but um, I'm very comfortable putting up my credibility against Scott Paterno's. The unfortunate reality here is that Scott got none of Joe Paterno's brains, and, it, and he probably also didn't get any of his ethics, and Jay Paterno, unfortunately, got none of Joe Paterno's balls. Jay is a very smart guy, nice guy, but he has no balls at all. And uh, Jay knows better. I believe if hooked up to a lie detector test, Jay Paterno would tell you that Jerry Sandusky never had sex with a boy. I don't believe he believes it. He's told me essentially that uh, there'd be no reason for him to have changed his mind since then. But unfortunately, Jay has allowed Scott to dominate here. And I think this cause has suffered greatly because of it. So that's Scott Paterno. Um, then there's People on the message boards who are usually complete cowards and totally ignorant, they hate me because they hate my tactics. That seems to be the number one, the number one argument against John Ziegler. You know, I agree with some of the things he says, but I don't like his tactics. Now, folks, um, do you not realize that this is a war uh, where our side has no weapons? We are outmanned, we are outgunned, we have no money, no resources. The media is a thousand percent against us. We've got nothing, all right? And so um, we needed to be 300 Spartans, okay? Not the French army in, in World War II. But that's what we ended up being, was the French army during World War II. Uh, and, you know, when you're the 300 Spartans, you do everything you can to win, all right? And I actually think I have been I had an incredibly high level of ethics. If people knew all the things that I didn't do, all the times that I pulled the, the, the foot off the accelerator because I wanted to make sure I was not accused of doing something that was unethical or uh, you know, created a problem perception-wise for the cause, you'd be astonished. I sleep exceedingly well at night on how I've handled all these situations. But I, just, I wish somebody would just tell me, what the heck does that mean? I don't like his tactics. What, what have I done? I, I've actually gone out of my way to remain as ethical as possible, especially under the circumstances. A lot of my tactics are also misunderstood. See, people think I'm playing chess. I mean, people think I'm playing checkers. I'm actually playing chess. I'm not a great chess player. I made a lot of mistakes. But I, you cannot judge what I'm doing based upon the first 24 hours of the reaction to it. That's why this is not a chess match. This is a checkers Wow, I'm screwing this up. This is, not, this is not a checkers match. This is a chess match, okay? In checkers, you know immediately whether it was a good move or a bad move. In chess, it might take a while. There are other reasons why I'm doing certain things. Like, for instance, might it not have an impact on the McQuarrie victim to see Dottie Sandusky crying on national TV? Might not that... Pull at his conscience a bit. Just think about it, folks. There's a lot of reasons why I do things. It's big picture, okay? Doesn't mean I'm always right.